We're in Parashat Tuldot, and we are facing in this parasha a very harsh reality that we see both Rivka and Yaakov that are lying to Yitzchak, and the Torah is okay with that. And if the Torah tells me something, it means that there's uh, something to learn from that. So what am I supposed to learn from that? It's okay to lie? Now, Bechlal, we see that the entire book of Bereshit, all we find is a lot of lies. Which is a very big question, because it says about our forefathers that they were honest. It's actually calling the book of Bereshit... Sefer HaYashar, the book of the honest one, referring to the forefathers and our matriarchs. It even says about Bilam HaRasha that he said, I wish I can die like the forefathers because they, they were honest. I, I wish I could die like them. And we find in many different places that it's talking about our forefathers, Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, and then the matriarchs, that they were honest people. But then again, it seems very obvious that they were going behind Yitzchak's back, tricking him, lying to him. And that's what I'm what supposed to learn from that. Is, is that okay to lie? It says about only, from everything in the Torah, there's only says on one, on one thing that I have to be, uh, take, move away from. It says, um, From anything that has to be a lie, that is a lie, move yourself from, from it. It doesn't say, move yourself from idol worship. It says, From a lie, ooh, run away from it like fire. So what is the Torah is trying to tell me when I see that Rivka and, ya and Yaakov together planning, planning it and they lying to Yitzchak. I want to learn what is the Torah trying to tell me. Because obviously it's a sin to lie, not allowed to lie. So it must be that the Torah is trying to tell me that there's something behind that. Now, we see in the entire book of Bereshit a lot of lies. And they're all coming from our forefathers. Starting with Avraham and Sarah. They lied. Avraham Avinu told Sarah, for the, the, the Egyptians, don't tell them I'm your husband. Tell them I'm your, your brother. So both Avram and Sarah lied. Okay, one might argue and say to save your life. But we see so many situations when they were lying. So many different situations. And we're going to go through them and we'll point some of them out. But there's a lot of lies going on in the, in the Torah. How, what am I supposed to learn from that? That is that okay to lie? Now in our parasha, it's the peak of the line when Yitzchak wanted to give the blessings to Esav and Yaakov and Rivka and they're, ooh, they, they don't like that and they coming and tricking the blessings out of it and Yitzchak wanted to give the blessings to Esav it says that he loved him, he liked him now we know, that, I mean we don't have to repeat the whole story the story was that Yitzchak was already old, he was blind there's different of opinions why he was blind. Some say that when he was on the altar and the knife went swinging almost to, to slaughter him, the sky opened and the angels were crying and the tears of the angels went into his eyes and he became blind. Another uh, reason why he became blind is because Asaph was hanging out with, uh, with Shiksas, with a lot of uh, non-Jewish girls. There were idol worshippers. Forget about they were not Jewish. They were idol worshippers and they would burn incense and the smoke of the incense made him blind. Another opinion says that he, he should not see that his son is going and becoming so far away from the Torah. But he, nevertheless, we know that Yitzchak was bl uh, blind and came the day that he wanted to give the blessing to Esav and he liked Esav for whatever reason. Esav was a very tricky guy. He knew how to fool his father and pretend and, they saw, and uh, apparently Yitzhak loved him. 
But what is the Torah trying to teach me with this whole story? The Torah is not coming only to teach me a historical event. It's coming to give me over something to, that I need to learn from. Now, this is not the first time that there was lying in Sefer Bereshit. I told you. First of all, we had Abraham and Sarah. They lied. You know also when it's Chak. Excuse me? Adam and Eve. But let's, we're talking now about our forefathers. I mean, there were many lies between Adam and Abraham of Eno. But we're talking about the forefathers because these are our symbol. So if we see that Abraham and Sarah lied, then we have another time that when Yitzchak was taken down to Grar with Rivka, he also had to lie the exact same lie that his wife is his sister and not his uh, wife. Not only that, in the, 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 the parasha, this is in parashat Vayechi, it's talking about that after the death of Yaakov, the, the tribes came to Yosef and they told him, you know that while our father Yaakov was alive, he told us that we should tell you that after he dies, you should not revenge what we did to you. Yaakov never said such a thing. Why are you lying? So now we see the Shvatim, the, the, the tribes are also liars. Everybody's lying. <laughs> Not only that, there's another time, and this is told in the parasha also of Vayichi, that, you know, the, the story says that a messenger came to tell Yosef that Yaakov is sick and he's about to die. What? You didn't see your father for so many years. You have such an unbelievable relationship between Yaakov and Yosef. And you want to tell me a messenger has to come to tell Yosef, listen, your father is sick and he's about to die. Don't you know the situation of your father? Don't you visit him every day? Or at least pick up the phone. How are you doing? Everything's okay. Can I send you something? There is a Midrash that says that the whole time that Yaakov was in, was in Mitzrayim, Yosef didn't see him. He, he saw him very little times. Yosef went out of his way to never be by himself with Yaakov. The whole time. He would see him in family events, he would see him in big gathering, but Yosef went out of his way not to have one second by himself with Yaakov. You know why? Because if Yosef would sit by himself with Yaakov, close doors, you know what would happen? Yaakov would tell Yosef, tell me, my dear son, what happened? Where were you for 17 years? Why couldn't you call me? Why, why didn't you give me a sign that you are alive? And Yosef did not want to lie. Because if he would tell him, let me tell you, your son sold me. Yosef did not want to be confronted by Yaakov by telling him, your brothers came with the garment, with the kutonet, full of blood, and they told me an animal ate you. But obviously an animal didn't eat you. What happened? Yosef said, I can't even get to that point because then I'm going to have to tell him. They lied. He didn't want to say Lashon Ara about his brothers. So Yosef Avinu was, was avoiding being by himself with Yaakov his father, that they were so connected, only so he will not be able to, lie, to, 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 to tell all his brothers. So there is somebody there who can lie. Excuse me? There is somebody there who can lie. A hundred percent. But it says, how come? I mean, we've seen Parashat Yechi that there's a messenger coming to Yosef. So Yosef was like, listen, I don't want to, talk, to be close with him because I'm going to have to tell him what happened. And that's not going to be good. Anyways, now we want to understand why Yaakov took the blessings Bemirma. That's what it says, Bemirma. He, he came and sneaked in and he took it. That's not, uh, that's not what I want to see from my father. Now more than that comes another question. Why would Rivka do that? Why would Rivka go behind Yaakov's back, behind Yitzchak's back and tell him that? She can't come and tell him straight to the face? That's a very big question because 
you know, when this whole thing happened, they were not so young. This was after 85 years of marriage. Because if the kids, Yaakov and Esav, were 64 years old, means that Rivka and Yitzchak were married for 85 years. 85 years? Now you have a problem coming to your husband and telling him, listen, I don't think you should give the brachot to Esav. He's a crook. He's a liar. You can't talk to him. I mean, why didn't they want Esav to get the brachot? Because they knew he's tricking Yitzchak. You know, the story says that he would pretend that he's so righteous, he would come and ask him questions in Torah and, and tell him, oh, today I learned this in yeshiva, to learn, today I learned that. He would trick him. So Rivka, what, she has a problem to come to Yaakov and say to, to Yitzchak, her husband, after 85 years and says, listen, my dear husband, I'm sorry to tell you, but one of our kids is not so kosher. Don't give him the brachot, you have to give it to Yitzchak. Why would Rivka couldn't come and approach to the, her husband? It's not that they're married for 10 years, 2 years, 3 years, and she's afraid. This is after 85 years of marriage. Go and talk to your husband and tell him, I'm sorry. Don't give the blessing to Esav. He's a guy, he's not a good guy. So, A, I want to know why Yaakov did this, and B, why Rivka did that. What is that teaching us? And why is it coming specifically in Mirma? Mirma is to cheat. It's not only lying. In order to cheat, you have to lie, of course. But that's cheating. Now, we know that this entire world is about cheating. This world is called the world of lie. Olama Shekel. Alma de Shikra. That's what it says in the Zohar. Everything in this world is about lying. Everything in this world is, is, is about the opposite of the truth. So much that the Torah actually tells me, Midvar Sheker Tichat, move yourself away from lying. So what is this trying to teach me? In simple words, that sometimes some things are important, more important than telling the truth. That's what I learned from that. That there are situations that I have to lie. Now we're going to learn. It's not about lying. The Torah doesn't allow me to lie. We're going to find out now. But what I learned from that is sometimes that certain values are much more important than the truth. If you don't mind, I know you want the window open, but the noise is very distracting. Maybe you can uh, close it. So this is what we can learn from that. But again, why is the Torah teaching me that? Because according to the Torah, they didn't sin. It doesn't say that Yaakov and Rivka sinned. It just said that they came be mirma. So again, we understand from that that sometimes certain values are more important than the truth. Now, the way to kind of look at it when it comes to lying and cheating, there are three, so to say, circles where a lie can or might be permitted to be. One of them is called between Adam and Chavero, between me and another person. Between me and another person, there will be times and we're going to quote Chazal, our sages, from the Talmud and other places that are allowing to lie. In a situation between me and another person. Then comes between, and by the way, between me and another person is also including mainly between me and my wife. Not just necessarily another person. Ben Adam Lechavero Bechlal is a mitzvah, is between me and my wife. But we know that there are certain situations that I'm allowed to, not to say the truth. What's the other situation? It's between me and an anjo. And what does that mean? Sometimes to survive in this world, I have, to, uh, I have to not be honest. How many times? Whether it's the Holocaust or other wars or whatever, or I, the people had to lie to get out of a situation, to survive. Then in some cases, I will be permitted to lie. Like Abraham and Sava, listen, this is life and death. But then there's another interesting realm where I'm so to say allowed to, allowed to lie. Our sage is calling the lying wearing the garments of Esav. He doesn't use the word lying because that's like a harsh word. Our sages use Lilvosh Bigde Esav. Wearing the garments of Esav is basically saying in other words lying. So when it's talking about lying to another uh, uh, individual that is not Jewish is 
Wearing the clothes of Esau, sometimes I have to pretend like being something that I'm not in order to save myself. But there is another realm when it's talking about lying and that's when it has to fix the world. When I have to correct something in the world, sometimes I'm allowed to wear the garments of Esau, meaning to lie, but not lie, but we were going to touch what it means. That's why I'm not using the word lie, rather wearing the garments of Esau. I have to put myself under some type of a disguise. You are 100% right, and this is what exactly what the Talmud is saying, and we're gonna uh, we're gonna touch that. But first of all, we have to understand that the entire parasha of Toldot is protecting Yaakov and Rivka. There's no persecution against them. It doesn't say in any way that they did something wrong. The entire parasha is protecting them. So I mean, if the Torah is exposing the situation, but then again also protecting them, then we have to understand that obviously. They did something that is, the, is permissible according to the Torah. Now, let's go a little bit back in history so we can really understand what's going on here. Rivka is being picked up by Eliezer last week from Haran, and she's three years old. They bring her to Yitzhak, they wait a few years, they get married. Now the poor girl can't get pregnant. She's trying for years to get pregnant, nothing. She's already getting a little bit frustrated. You can imagine, a young lady can get pregnant. Finally, after squeezing the kishka out in prayers, she gets pregnant. Now she has a very, very hard pregnancy. Throwing up, she can't go to sleep, she can't eat, she can't... She has a very hard pregnancy. Every time she passes next to a shul or yeshiva, she feels something going on. Something is moving inside of her. Then she passes next to a place of idol worship. Another, she feels another thing is pushing inside. Now she's going through a very hard pregnancy. She decides not to go to her husband, who's a tzaddik, Yitzhak, to ask him what's going on. What's her next option? To go to Abraham Avinu, the next tzaddik. She says, listen, what, I'm going to come now and start complaining to them that I have problems in my pregnancy and I'm throwing up and I have all sorts of issues. She didn't want to also worry them. There's one opinion that says, why didn't she go to Yitzchak or to Avram? One opinion says she didn't want to worry them that something's going on. Where does she go? To Tzfat. She comes here to Shem and Ever. She comes up here, she goes to Shem, the son of Noach, and she tells him what's going on here. Now, he didn't have ultrasound at the time. But he looks at her stomach and he says, you have twins. Really? I have twins? Yeah. And not only that you have twins, one of them is a tzaddik and another one is a troublemaker. And he already reveals to her a secret and he tells her three words that are the cutting points of everything and this is what she carries with her. What does he tell her? One of them is always going to overpower the other. And they're always going to fight too to overpower each other. But he tells her three words and this is where he reveals to her a secret. And she's holding that secret for 64 years. She actually is not even saying that secret. And what does he tell her? Three words. And the one who's older is going to be a servant to the younger one. Meaning, in other words, the second one is the, is the big one, not the first one. So he tells her there's going to be two of them. One of them is going to be a tzaddik, one is going to be a troublemaker, but just that you know, it's the younger one that is the tzaddik. She goes home, and you think she tells the news to Yitzhak? How is that going to be interpreted? Oh, by the way, Yitzhak, I don't think you're that a tzaddik that I had to go all the way to Tzfat to meet Shem and to ask from him for advice. That's going to cause a problem in Shlom Bayit. Yitzhak will be like, why are you asking me? Why didn't you come to me? Why didn't you go to my father? You have to travel all the way to Shem? So she decides not to say anything and she lives with a secret. <coughs> and she sees it before her eyes. She doesn't tell Yitzhak. She could have told Yitzhak, listen, by the way, I got some, uh, 
some uh, information here. The first one is going to be a, a problem, a problematic one. She decides not to tell it to Yitzchak and she keeps it as a secret and they grow and Yitzchak learns to develop a certain love to Esav. Now, of course, there's one opinion that says that she didn't want to make him upset. How would it sound that somebody tells you, yeah, one of your children is going to be a wicked guy. But more than that, we see a very interesting way the Torah, how it uh, expresses itself. It says, Ve'itzchak ahavet Esav, kitzayd be'yado, ve'rivka ahavet Yaakov. So Yaakov, it doesn't say why Rivka liked him. It just says, Rivka avait Yaakov. Yaakov is a likable person, doesn't matter what it is. The Torah comes and says, Yaakov, Yitzchak liked Esav because he was a good hunter. So it had to come with the definition, why did Yitzchak like him? He was a good hunter. Now it didn't mean, doesn't mean that he was good in hunting deer. Rather, he knew how to manipulate words and to sound in the ears of Yitzchak like he's a tzaddik. He would come home from yeshiva and say to his father, you know what we learned today, don't ask. He would come in the morning, listen to the topic, read in the, in the schedule what's going to be, go do whatever he wants, then go home and tell his father, what did you learn today? Ooh, I learned about this, about that. He knew how to fool Yitzchak. Now more than that, what, would we, what he would ask him questions all the time? He would ask him if... I have a, a salt, do I need to give myself from salt? You don't have to give myself from salt. And he knew that Yitzchak is very sensitive. Yitzchak, his mitzvah was miser. Yitzchak was very big in maser, with all the, the wells and everything. So he knew how to trick him. So not that there was a hunter when going to hunt deers. Rather he would hunt him with his words. He knew how to, to really cheat him with words to make him feel that is so great, and Yitzchak uh, developed a certain love. Now, only after the brachot that was stolen, Yitzchak figured out that there was a, that, that Yaakov here and Rivka cheated. Now, what you would think that a person that really loves his son and just finds out that the other son cheated him to get the blessing, what would you think would be the reaction? Getting a fit. How dare he? How dare he come and sell? You would think that Yitzchak would flip out. What is the answer? Gam baruch When Esav walked in and says, wait, it's my turn to get the bracha. How does the story go? Esav walks in and he tells his father, stand up, I brought you food. Yitzchak says, wait a minute, who are you? He says, I'm, your, I'm Esav, your son. He tells him, but you were just here. He's like, I wasn't just here. He's like, I just gave you a blessing. Esau figures out, oh my God. Yitzchak, Yaakov again scammed me. First he did it with the, being the, the older one, the Bechor. Now he came and tricked me and took my blessing. So he tells Yaakov, Yitzchak, I was fooled. Yaakov uh, 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 cheated both of us. So you would think that Yitzchak would lose his temper. Yitzchak says, he's also going to be blessed you would think that Yitzchak would lose it. Here, the Ramban says that Yitzchak didn't lose it because he understood at the point, okay, that was the one who was supposed to get the bracha. Obviously, that's when he understood it, so no point to get upset. So, again, comes me, brings me back to the question, why, why lying? Why, is it, why am I supposed to lie? Why is that okay to lie? Again, I've come up with the same question. So, if this is all true, if Yitzchak, Yaakov, was the one who was supposed to get the blessing, why do it in a cheating way? Just come to Yaakov, and come to Yitzchak. Tell him, listen, this is the situation. So and so. Why have to go like that? Now, the thing is that that's what I told you before, that Yaakov, what he did was permissible. He didn't do anything against the Torah. But, that's what I told you before, that you should know that for everything that you do, even if it's permissible from the Torah, that mean, meaning that there's a loophole that allows you to do it, don't think that there's not going to be a reaction. 
Now, Yaakov was not punished for lying, but there was a consequence. There was a reaction for his action. And there was a price for that. Everything that you do, there is a price for that. This is called Midah Keneged Midah. Just know, the yes, Halacha will permit you to do certain things. Just know that there will be a price to pay. And where do we see that? It says that Yaakov, Yaakov ba b'mirma. Mirma is cheating, but in a very sophisticated way. It's using the word mirma. Leramot is to cheat. Mirma is literally the, the action. The Torah repeats this word three times. And every time that it repeats it, it has to do with Yaakov. When is the first time we see, first of all, the first time we see is Yaakov cheating Yitzchak? It says, Uba mirma. When is the next time that we meet that word mirma? Is when Lavan did that to Yaakov. That he gave Yaakov Leah, not Rachel, using the same word mirma. So Yaakov was not punished, but the tables turned. He came and cheated his father, then he was cheated too. And he was given Leah instead of Rachel. Now, more than that, the next time we see that is that the Shvatim, uh, they cheated Yaakov. Same thing, we see the Mirma. They came and they cheated him, the whole thing with Yosef. And another thing is, later on it says about Shimon and Levi that they came be Mirma and they went into Shechem and they killed everybody there. And Yaakov didn't approve to that, by the way. Later on, when Yaakov, when they, when Yaakov found out about it, he was very upset with them. He says, this is not how we do business. But they cheated Yaakov out of his opinion, and they went and they killed everybody in Shechem. So Yaakov came to Yitzchak Bemirma three times it's repeating the fact that they, he was, so to say, cheated. What's the word? Excuse me? The word of the word is... Mirma. The verb is Leramot. Oh, you mean the route, the shoresh. Uh -huh. Then the shoresh is, I guess, maybe reish mem, lamed reish mem. Doesn't say the shoresh. Since it's coming as a verb, maybe it's just reish mem. <laughs> but the word is mirma, cheating, and leramot is to cheat. So we see that Yaakov didn't get punished, but there was some type of a price to pay, that he got cheated. Now, let's for one second jump to next week. And next week we meet a story that Yaakov was supposed to marry Rachel. And then he's given Leah instead. Now, when Yaakov asked Leah, why did you cheat me? I'm not surprised about your father. Your father's a crook. Why did you allow it to happen? Now imagine the scene. Yaakov falls in love with Rachel, he comes to Lavan, <laughs> Lavan tells him, work for her for seven years, seven years he works for her, the night before they switch land the tent, hop, comes into the wedding, the next day he wakes up in the morning, he sees Leah. You would also think that he would lose it. But he doesn't go out, later on he goes to Lavan and says, Lama Rimitani, why did you, call, why did you cheat me? Then, of course, Lavan answers him, listen, this is not our way. First you marry the older one, etc. But he asked Leah, why did you approve to that? I'm surprised of you. You know what, he answered, what she answered him? You taught me that. You taught me that when you want something good, you have to cheat. I wanted something good. You wanted the blessing from your father? You wanted something good? You cheated your brother and your father. I wanted something good. I wanted to be married to the tzaddik. So I cheated you too. You taught me that it's okay to cheat when it comes to some to get something good. Now, to explain really why the Torah is allowing to cheat, we'll tell a, a story that we, I told the story a few times, but it will help us understand. And there was once a guy, unfortunately, was in a hospital, sitting in a bed for months, and he had a roommate in the hospital room. Unfortunately, they were both very sick. They couldn't move out of their beds. So there was one guy close to the window, and there was another guy closer to the wall. The guy next to the window kept telling him, you know what, let me tell you what I see outside the window. Oh, 
such a beautiful day. The sun is shining today. And what, 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 what else do you see? What do you see? The guy in the other bed tells him, Ah, it is a beautiful pond outside. Oh, oh look, 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 I see ducks, they're coming. Oh, so here's a few mothers, they're coming with their kids. And the, today the flowers are gorgeous. And every day he would tell him what's going on outside. And you know, it gave him a lot of hope and a lot of inspiration. Unfortunately, after a couple months, the guy next to the window died. The nurse comes in and she tells him, I'm sorry to tell you, your roommate died. He's upset. He tells him, excuse me, now that the bed next to the window is empty, can I move to be next to the window so I can enjoy what's going on? He tells him a window. She moves him to the bed next to the window and he looks and there's no window. There's just a wall. And the room never had a window. And the other guy was just telling him all sorts of stories just to give him some hope and some inspiration. So sometimes you can or should lie. Now we will see a few, a few scenarios that our sages are allowing to lie. I mean, in this story, by him lying to him, he gave him hope and inspiration. It's a beautiful day. There's this flowers, there's birds outside. He literally gave him inspiration. Now the Talmud comes a few times and it says, when am I allowed to lie? So there is a Gemara in Masechet Ketubot, and it says, Keitzad merakdim lifnei akala. How do you dance in front of the kala? And it gives a scenario that a person marries a woman, and then he comes to his best friend and says, No, oh, what do you think of my wife? Isn't she gorgeous? Now really, she's not really gorgeous. She looks like Godzilla. And what is the friend going to tell him? She's horrible. What, what, are, you, you, what are you, blind? Godzilla. Whatever, you know, just, just, listen, we got to laugh sometimes. But uh, she wasn't attractive. She looked like the, the, the older sister of E.T. Whatever. She wasn't an attractive lady. And his friend is telling him, his best friend, what do you think of my wife? Isn't she gorgeous? So what would the friend answer? Should he answer, no. She, she looks like a, like a jellyfish. What are you, whatever, whatever. like, no. Talmud says, no, you should tell her, tell him, She's gorgeous. She's beautiful. That's what the Talmud says. Don't tell him. Don't make him feel bad by telling him that she's horrible. He thinks she's beautiful. Tell him she's beautiful. So this is lying, right? What is he going to say? He's going to tell him the truth. Your wife looks, she's unattractive. She's horrible. The Talmud says, no. For the honor of your friend, you're, by not hurting him, you can tell him that yeah, your, your wife is beautiful. It's fine. It's good. That's where there's a, I mean, there's a song of that. Kate said, Meragdim Lifnea Kala. But Hila says, Kalana Ave Chasuda. It's a question in the Gemara. I'm not making it up. There's a question in the Talmud. What happens if there's a wedding and the bride is not so attractive and the groom tells his friend, How, what do you think about my wife? But Hila says, Tagid, say, Kalana Ave Chasuda. She's pretty, she's beautiful, and she looks very modest. Okay, so the Talmud here is telling me, for the honor of my friend, I can lie. I can not tell him the truth. Comes another Talmud, another Gemara. This can be found in the Tractate of Yabamot. And another situation is presented. And in this situation, it's saying that peace is more important than truth. And where do we learn that? And we, it gives an example that Shmuel, the prophet Shmuel, was approached by God who told him, go to Bethlehem and anoint David the Melech to be king. Shmuel says, are you serious? There is already a king. I can't do that. This is uh, going against the king. I can get killed for that. How can I go and anoint David Amelech to be king when there's a king, another King Shaul? You know what Hashem answered him? You don't have to tell them you're going to David Amelech. Shmuel says to Hashem, what? Hashem says, what didn't you understand? I told, I told, she told you. Don't tell them you're going to David Amelech. 
Shmuel says, yeah, but I'm going to come to Bethlehem. They're going to see the prophet coming. Everybody will stand up. Oh, the Navi, the prophet is here. What's the first question they're going to ask me? What are you doing here? Why did you come here? What am I going to tell them? So Hashem says, we'll take a sheep with you and tell them that you came to sacrifice a sheep. So Hashem is basically telling Shmuel, don't tell them the truth. I didn't tell you to lie. I didn't tell you to lie. I just tell them, told you, don't tell them all the truth. So take a sheep with you. Tell them you came to sacrifice it. Sacrifice the sheep. Did I tell you to lie? I didn't tell you to lie. I just didn't tell you to tell the whole truth. So the Gemara learns from that, that for peace, then you don't have to say the entire truth. Say part of the truth. I didn't say to lie. The Torah doesn't say lie. It just says don't tell the whole truth. So we learn from that, that Hashem allowed Shmuel not to tell the entire truth. That's what the Gemara learns from that, that peace is more important than truth. Where do we see it again, that peace with truth? Remember that the Malachim, two, two weeks ago, the angels came to tell Avram Avinu that Sarah is going to have a baby. Sarah laughed, remember? She giggled. Eh, me, I'm 90 years old. Now, when Hashem approached Sarah, first of all, he asked Avram Avinu, why did she laugh? Sarah said, I didn't laugh. <laughs> of course, there's the story that, that when Hashem asked Sarah, why did you laugh? She told him, I didn't laugh, it's not me. Hashem says, what, are you making a joke? I saw you laugh. Sarah answered, no, that's not me. I did tshuva. It's the old Sarah that laughed. I did tshuva. It's not me. I didn't laugh. But when Hashem approached Avram Avinu, he didn't want to tell him that Sarah laughed because that would be a, a problem of Shlom Bait. Avram Avinu would be like, what, you're laughing? That's not appropriate. So when Hashem approached Avram Avinu, he didn't tell him Sarah laughed. And it says, Vaniza Kanti. Because he didn't want to, uh, he didn't uh, want to cause a shlom bite issue between Sarah and Avram. That Hashem says, no, 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 nothing happened. She didn't laugh. It's okay. It's all fine. And we find in many other places that the Torah allows me to maybe I won't say lie, but bend the rules. Now, how is the Torah coming and allowing me to do such a thing? From a very simple thing. The Torah allows me, I'm going to say it in Hebrew and then translate it because in Hebrew that's the way it sounds. Mutar le ramot ramai. I'm allowed to cheat a cheater. In English it doesn't sound no good, but I'm allowed to cheat somebody that he is a cheater. And where do I learn it from? Even though Yaakov came way before David Amelech, David Amelech teaches this to us. In, in, in chapter 19, I say this chapter, this verse, many, many times. But the chapter says, Im gvar tamim titam, im chasid tit chasad, im gvar tamim titamam, im navar tit baral, vim mikesh tit patal. If somebody is a chasid, then you should be chasid with him. If somebody is, is uh, 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 im gvar tamim, somebody is tamim titamam, aval im mikesh titapal, tit patal. Ikesh is somebody that is stubborn. But really, Ikesh is somebody that is a crook. David Amalek says, with a crook, you can be a crook on him. You can cheat a crook. So, the Torah is actually giving me permission to cheat a crook. <coughs> now, there's a story that kind of uh, strengthened this. And the story says that there was once an individual who couldn't make money. And he had to go out of town to make money. And in the olden days, this was common. The husband would go disappear for a year, two years. He has to go and make money. Okay, he went to a faraway land. He started making money. Saved a lot of money. Then it was time to go back after three years. On the way back, he catches a ride with a guy that had a wagon. Tells him, can I join you? I'm going to that place. Yeah, you can join me. Of course, on the journey comes Shabbat. They have to stop. Now, this sack full of money is Muktzeh. What is he going to do with the money? Can't hold the money. So he says, okay, I'll hide the money. Okay. He hides the money somewhere in the wagon. 
The second after Shabbat leaves, he goes to the hiding place to get the money, and sure enough, the money is not there. Now he knows the wagon driver took the money. Who else is going to take it? He comes to approach the guy, and he tells him, why did you take my money? I didn't take your money. No, I'm telling you, there was my money. No, I didn't take any of your money. I'm sorry to tell you, I didn't touch your money. Of course, he gets upset. Three years of hard work. He took my money. What am I going to do now? I'm going to come home now. My wife is going to ask me, where were you for three years? At least I, if I come with money, but what am I going to do now? He doesn't know what to do. Right away, he reaches his town. Right away, he runs to the rabbi. He tells the rabbi, I don't know what to do. Three years I've been working. I saved a lot of money. Finally... I was able to come home, I'm catching a ride with this wagon driver, and, I, and he steals my money, what am I going to do? The rabbi tells him, go home, don't worry, everything will be okay, go home. A few days later, this wagon driver comes to the rabbi, and what does he have, is all the wagon, what is it full with? Barrels of wine. This guy comes to the rabbi and tells him, Rabbi, can you give me a hechshel? The rabbi says, I'm sorry to tell you, I can't give you a hechshel. Why? He says, I don't know who, uh, who prepared the wine. The merchant, the wagon driver, tells him, I prepared the wine. It's kosher. So he says, uh, but uh, how do I know that it's only you? He tells him, I'm telling you, it's only me. The rabbi says, okay. But before I give you a hechshel to sell all your wine, you know that this guy came to me and told me that you gave him a ride and that you stole his money? Is that true? Right away the wagon driver says, no, it's not me, he's making it up, I didn't do anything. So he says, listen, but the guy told me that he had money and it was stolen. So the wagon driver says, you know what, probably my helper, the guy, the non -Jew, probably he stole it. So the rabbi says, so wait a minute. So if you had a non-Jew on the wagon who probably stole it, how do I know that your non-Jew didn't touch the barrels? No, I can't give you a hechshel. The wagon driver is like, oh my God, now I'm going to lose my entire business. If I don't have a hechshel, how am I going to sell the wine? So he made a quick calculation and he says, better to come clean. So he told the rabbi, I'm sorry. you know, it, it was me. <laughs> I'm sorry, it was me. Just give me the hechshel for the wine. She says, oh, so it was you. Now go return the money to the Jew, apologize, and give him extra money for the, the trouble, like a penalty, and, and sure enough, and then I'll give you the hechshel. So he gives him back the money, of course. Uh, good ending was a Hollywood production, and everybody was happy. <laughs> but what do we see from here? that the rabbi knew, knew what's going on there, but he had to, so to say, cheat the cheater to get the truth out. So you're allowed to cheat. The rabbi knew the, merchant, the, the wagon driver is a cheater. So he just said, he manipulated the situation to say, oh, if there was the non-Jew there, then he touched you on, he can't give you a hechshel. Excuse me? Whatever it is that he, but the, he put the, the driver on, a, in a, in, on his spot, knowing, I mean, the rabbi lied to him, and the rabbi knew exactly. The rabbi also had to lie by telling him, maybe it was the, if the, if the non-Jew was there, he was playing the game, so to say. So we see from that also that you're allowed to cheat a cheater. Somebody comes to cheat you, cheat you, you can cheat him back. This is what the Torah says. This, I'm not inventing it. I'm not telling you to cheat anyone. But, what is the Torah telling us? For the sake of peace, you can't lie. You can't lie. It doesn't say you're allowed to lie. You know what it says? It says, Leshanot. It just says, Mutar Leshanot Mipnei Shalom. This is what the, the, the Talmud says. You're allowed to change for the sake of peace can lie, but you can change it in such a way that it's not 100% the truth, or you're just not telling all the details. That was the case with Hashem and Shmuel, that Hashem told him, just don't tell all the details. Just say one detail, and then you're not lying. 
A little bit what? So I'll give you another example. There is a story in the Talmud about a certain uh, sage that his name was Reb Chia. And Reb Chia had marital problems with his wife. And Lama Shalom bite issues. And the Talmud says that she was uh, <laughs> going a little bit to annoy him. So he told her, can I have uh, potato soup? She will give him lentil soup. He wanted an apple, she gave him a melon. Everything he says, she gave him the other way around. So his son saw what's going on. So he would go and tell the mom, let's say, Abhia would want coffee. So he would tell his mom, dad wants tea. So she would make him coffee and he would get the coffee. So one time, the <laughs> one time he asked his son, what's, uh, what, what's going on? How come is... Uh, how come uh, I'm, uh, suddenly she's uh, doing what, what I want? So the son said, listen, I'm just, I'm not lying to her. I'm just, just not telling all the truth. I mean, I'm saying to her, you want tea? I didn't say, I'm not telling her, listen, he doesn't want uh, tea. Or give him some, I just tell him, I'm saying the truth, but not exactly the details. I'm just saying he wants tea. I know she's going to give you coffee. So... Not telling all the details, and again, I'm not giving you now ideas how to get out of situations. I know now you want me to come and uh, tell you systems, how can you lie to get out of a situation. That's not what we're doing here. We're trying to first understand why Yaakov and Rivka were allowed to lie. Why did the Torah allow it? So first of all, we see that uh, Esau was a cheater. He was a Ramai. So the Torah comes and says, he, you are allowed to cheat, Aramai. Especially somebody like Esav, when they, he wasn't supposed to get the brachot. But it says that you are allowed to, to, to change the, the, not to lie, but to change the sin, not to come and invent something. Just say the detail is not really like this, the detail is like that. As long as that detail is true. And sometimes it's about just not telling all the details. Now when it comes to the question in the Talmud, how uh, should I lie to my uh, friend when he's asking me if his bride is pretty or not, I can say, tell to him she is pretty. You know what? Because I'm not lying. Because in his opinion she's pretty. So I'm not, I'm not saying a lie. I'm saying the truth. You think she's pretty? She's pretty. So when the Talmud allows me to tell to my friend, my bri your bride is pretty, I'm not lying here. My opinion is that she's not attractive. You think she's pretty? Probably her mom also, also thinks that she's pretty. And I'm not saying a lie here. Same thing here. Now, <clears throat> the point is that, first of all, we have to understand that the Torah is basically coming and justifying the act of uh, Rivka and Yaakov that they're saying, first of all, he didn't deserve really the brachot. First of all, Rashi explains that the reason why Yaakov was really the Bechor, he didn't have to cheat, so to say, by the Bechorah, because the example Rashi says that if you take now a, a tube and you will put two balls in the tube, or whatever you put in, the first one that goes in will come out second. So Yitzchak really, that we know that he was, uh, uh, that when he was with Rebka, then first of all what came in, the first drop, was Yaakov, was Yitzchak, well, sorry, it was Yaakov. It went in first, then came es Esav. So who came out first? Esav came out first. But really, Yaakov is the Bechor. Yaakov is the older one. So Yaakov didn't cheat. They just didn't say all the details. So the Torah comes and says, no, you know, they didn't lie to anything. First of all, Yaakov is the, is the Bechol. He's the one who's supposed to get, supposed to get it. The fact that Esau cheated Yitzchak, that's a whole different thing. But specifically, where the Torah is giving a support to both the act of Rivka and Yaakov, that it says, you're allowed to cheat a cheater. You're allowed to wear the clothes of Esau in order to get something that is rightfully yours. So that's first of all. But here comes a different question because the Torah, if the Torah is already telling me something, 
is to teach me something. The Torah is not telling me now, okay, go and cheat the world. Or the Torah is not telling me, okay, get out of a situation by cheating. That's what the Torah is telling me. I'm not supposed to look for loopholes where I can cheat. If I'm already coming to the situation, okay, I, can, I need to find how the way, how to, so to say, wear the garments of Esau to change the situation. But really we want to take something for it. What does it got to do with me? If the Torah is already teaching me that, it's not only teaching me a historical event, rather it's teaching me something to apply. If you remember, I told you there are three realms, so to say, three circles where the lying comes into action. One is between Ben Adam le Chavero, between one person to another. So we see the Talmud actually tells me when it comes to something like the, the example with the bride, you're allowed to say the, the truth that sounds a little bit different to bring peace. The second cycle, I told you, the circle was to save my life. When it's out in the world, I, I need to survive, I can lie. So we see Abraham Avinu and Sarah or Yitzchak. But the third I told you is when it has to lie, it has to correct the world. Sometimes I have to put on a costume, the, the garments of Esav, to do some type of a correction in the world. And that's really the main teaching what this story is coming to tell me, is that I came here to do a tikkun in the world, to make some type of a rectification in the world. But sometimes I have to go undercover. Sometimes I have to, so to say, not say all the truth that it will be accepted because I'm, I have an agenda here. And I heard not too long ago an interesting story that kind of strengthened what I'm trying to say. There was a certain individual that lived in America in the 50s and the 60s, and they were very pro-Israel. And at the time, they approached the Lubavitcher Rebbe and asked him, what should I do? So he told him, go to Israel. You don't have kids, leave your family, start establishing businesses there. He had a lot of money. That way you create jobs, you create uh, uh, communities. So sure enough he went and he opened a lot of factories here in Israel for textile and, and clothing. And he was able to provide thousands of people with a workplace and building communities and building the economy. At some point, I mean, Israel is a little nothing, so he had to go to Europe to go to all these big expos to buy, to sell. So he went to one expo, and the expo fell on Shabbat. He's like, what am I gonna do now? What, I'm gonna, you know, I, I'll sell things on Friday, I'll sell things on Sunday, but the day of the business is Shabbat. What am I not gonna, what, I keep the booth open? Being an observant Jew, he says, listen, Shabbat is Shabbat. So, Friday afternoon, he puts a little sign on the door, we're closed, for celebrating the Shabbat, the Jewish holiday. And we'll be open back on Sunday. When he said that uh, uh, to the secretary of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, he told it, the secretary told it to the Rebbe, and the Rebbe says, you didn't do good. What? You didn't do good. He was also, what? So he says, listen. What good would it do when you're putting the sign at five minutes before Shabbat? You need to put the sign on Wednesday by saying on in two days from now at 4.15 is Shabbat and I'm going to be closed for the holiday for the Shabbat and we'll reopen on Sunday. So anyone that needs to see from that knows already on, on Wednesday. Why are you putting it five minutes before Shabbat? Basically saying to him, in other words, you think you went to the expo to make money? <laughs> no! You went to the expo to do Kiddush Hashem, to advertise to everybody there that there's a Shabbat. And that if there's any Jew there, they should know Shabbat comes in at 4.15. You went to bring a rectification to the world, to advertise to everybody in that expo that a Jew on Shabbat Closes the business, he doesn't care. He closes the business. So you came to do a tikkun, a rectification in the world. So it happens to be that you ended up in the expo. You didn't go there to make money. So when it comes to do a tikkun in the world, you have to put the garments of a sub, and sometimes you have to be a little bit manipulating or moving the truth from side to side, not lying. 
not making something up. This is a problem in our generation that many people, they want to help another person and do their outreach and they're lying. They're sugarcoating it. Feeling that if I sugarcoat it, if I don't, if I tell you straight out how it is, you'll be like, I don't like that. And you'll go away. That's the wrong attitude. The Torah doesn't allow you. That's lying. That's not sugarcoating. That's not a, 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 a changing. You're allowed to make it sound a little bit better, not to tell all the details, so you'll be able to reach that rectification in the world. To lie, you are strictly prohibited. We're not allowed to lie. There's no, uh, uh, there's no permission in whatsoever to lie, but you're allowed to change something. Of course, I'm not talking about when it's saving your life. I'm talking about when it's something as like when you want asked about in Shlom Bayit, to bring peace, then you don't have to say all the truth. How many times the situations that if one person doesn't know all the truth, then it will save from a big argument. But this is in the literal level. We want to take it to a more, a more spiritual level and to apply it into my life. I'm not looking to lie. But when it comes to the Yetzer Ara, to the Yetzer Ara, I'm allowed to manipulate. He's a, he's a crook. The Yetzer Ara is, is a cheater. I'm allowed to cheat the Yetzer Ara. When it comes to fight the Yetzer Ara, that's when I'm allowed to put... The, the garments of Esav. And that's where David Amir says, Im gvar tamim titamam, somebody is honest and truth and truthful, then you be the same thing with him. But in Ikesh, titpatal. Ikesh can be somebody stubborn, then you go in all sorts of tricky ways, but Ikesh is also a, a cheater, a liar. And you be the same way with him. Who is the cheater that we're de dealing with? The Yetzirah. Comes to teach, teach me, teach, cheat me all the time. Then you can cheat the Yetzirah back. That's when I have to wear the garments of, of Esau. And that's what the story is coming to tell me. That that's what I need to do. That Esau had a, 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 an agenda. The Yetzirah has an agenda. So lie to the Yetzirah too. So this is maybe what we want to take from this whole story. And first of all, we have to understand that Yaakov and, and, and Rivka, they, they worked based according to the Torah. That's why we see that they were not punished or they're not called out as cheaters. And we see that specifically when it comes for a cheater, you're allowed to cheat him. But what I really want to take from that is how, when am I dressing the garments of Esav in this world, so to say in quotes, to cheat the world, but it's just basically changing the situation so I can bring a rectification to the world. And that's when I need to go to the essence of Yaakov. The essence of Yaakov was to bring Tikkun to the world. So Yaakov was, when we, we asked two questions, why did Rivka participate in it? And why did Yaakov participate in it? Rivka participated in it because she knew she had a prophecy from Shem that Yaakov is the one. She just need to follow through. That's why she allowed it to happen. Why didn't you tell uh, Yitzhak? He wouldn't accept it the right way. He would get offended. What, now, you, now you're telling me? After 85 years? Now you're telling me that my son is not kosher? So she didn't lie. She just says, I don't need to say all the details. Why cause a problem right now? Uh, but she did it based on the fact that Shem told her, listen, listen, the first one is a crook, the second one is the tzaddik. Why did Yaakov... Uh, 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 allowed it to happen because Yaakov knew exactly who his brother is. That's who the cheater, you're allowed to cheat the cheater. He knew he doesn't, he's not supposed to get it. But Yaakov, as holy as he was, sometimes says, okay, when it's time to bring a tikkun to the world, I have to wear the garments of Esau. That's where he wore the, 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 the jacket. The jacket was actually uh, stolen by Esau from Nimrod. It was Nimrod that was wearing it. Later on, there's an opinion if uh, that actually Nimrod actually gave it to Esav, but it was uh, uh, Nimrod that stole it from Adam Arijon. Excuse me? It's also personal. Of course, it's personal. That's where you have to work based on the Torah. But we want to take from that, that Yaakov, when it came to bring a tikkun to the world, a rectification to the world, he was willing to wear the garments of Esav, and so to say, to cheat the cheater, 
And here it's referring to us when we have to have to bring a tikkun to the world. Hey, I have to cheat the Yetzirah. Not to fall for him, to cheat him. To tell him, yeah, 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 I'm going to listen to you later. Sometimes the Yetzirah tells you, comes in, yeah, yeah, okay, I'll do what you tell me in an hour. Let me first do what I'm supposed to do. You can cheat the Yetzirah. And you actually have to develop all these systems, how you're lying to the Yetzirah to, to cheat him. I mean, after all, what do we do on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur when we blow the Shofar? We're cheating the Yetzirah. Not, I mean, not that he's that stupid, but we still. But really what I need to understand from that, when it comes to f fix the world and to bring the world to a tikkun, I'm allowed not to expose all the truth, and I should wear the garments of Esav and to be able to go around in different ways in order to get my agenda in order to bring the rectification to the world. And that's really what I need to take from this story, is that when it's coming to do something good, then you, you need to use your imagination. How am I doing it in such a way that it's going to affect the world in a much better place? But there is other Hashem. We should reach to that level that we're able to bring this tikkun to the world. There's other Hashem. We should not find ourselves in situations that we are required to lie. We should have a beautiful, restful week and a week of truth. <laughs>